Yes, hi. Um, my name is William. I'm calling from Tampa, Florida. I work at a school here. I'm a school bus driver. And uh, I hear some interesting conversations between the, between the children. There was a conversation between the uh, two five-year-olds where uh, one five-year-old said, who did you vote for? <laughs> and the other five-year-old said, I, I voted for Biden. And then the other five-year-old said, well, I voted for uh, Trump because Biden stole this election. So I'm listening to this five-year-old talking about, I guess, a conspiracy theory that has been brewed up by Trump about Biden stealing the election. And I'm just wondering, since the Lincoln Project's um, main objective is to do away with Trumpism, how are you going to do away with Trumpism when a five-year-old is saying that uh, Biden stole the election and there's another 13 years to go before this five-year-old gets to vote. Yes, this is Diane from Baytown again. I'd like to know how come the GSA will not give Joe Biden the, the PDBs and all of the other information that he needs to get ready to lead our country because it is time. Trump needs to go and normalcy needs to reign again because this has been the longest election year of my entire life. Friday, November 13th. Everybody's feeling great, right? Um, right? Today on Vote for America, we'll be talking with Dr. Art Markman and the Lincoln Project's own Zach Chikowski. And now our host, Lincoln Project co-founder, Jennifer Horn. And welcome to Vote for America on LPTV. I'm so glad that you are with us today. You would really enjoy it if you were behind the scenes here. Every day as we come on the air, our producer, Jeremy's in, the, in my ear saying, 10 out, three, four, two. He's always worried I'm gonna miss it. He always thinks I'm not paying attention, but I'm here and I'm happy to be here and I'm happy that you're with us. Uh, I wanna give you some news since we were last together uh, on Wednesday, a lot of uh, significant changes uh, in the race. Arizona was called late last night by I believe almost 12,000 votes. Joe Biden officially has been called for Arizona. And just a few minutes ago, uh, they called Georgia, NBC News called Georgia for Joe Biden as well. So what does that mean? That means that Joe Biden uh, not only clearly won this race, it was with 306 electoral votes to Donald Trump's 232 electoral votes. Um, hard to call that a close race. Joe Biden has won uh, by a significant margin, and I don't mind sharing with you, uh, with 78 million votes and the popular vote, Joe Biden has won more votes than any presidential candidate ever before in the history of our country. So how's that for some good news to start your day? 
Uh, we are really looking forward to having our guests on today. There are a couple of our favorites, and I know you've enjoyed them in the past. We're going to have Dr. Art Markman and uh, Lincoln Project's political director, Zach Joukowsky, with us. And we'd love to have you join us live. Uh, you got have the uh, phone number there. You can call in. Uh, if you have questions for them, you can tweet your questions with the hashtag Ask Vote for America, or you could come on the show live yourself if you have a question for one of the two of them. And there's the Zoom meeting ID right there on your screen. Write that down, go to Zoom, sign in, use that meeting ID. Uh, and there'll be some producers there waiting to welcome you. We'd love to hear your questions uh, and have you be part of the show today. So uh, as oh, we're gonna try to jump right into things today, actually, because we know we have um, a, lot on the, a lot on the docket today. Uh, first, let's introduce uh, Lisa, Senegal. She is one of the co-founders of the Marin Group and Lincoln Project's resident independent voter. Lee, uh, Lisa, great to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Great to be here. Excited to talk to Dr. Markman. Always excited to talk to Dr. Markman. Uh, and just a reminder, I'll say it one more time before we jump right into that. If you would like to join uh, this this show, you're, you can do that by calling in or joining the Zoom and bring your questions directly to Dr. Markman yourself. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome our first guest to the show today. Uh, he's a cognitive scientist, an author, a blogger. He wrote a book uh, called Bring Your Brain to Work, and he co-hosts uh, the podcast called Two Guys on Your Head. He's been with us before. Uh, we love having him here to help us kind of uh, make our way through the crazy maze of these Donald Trump days. Dr. Markman, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, it's great to be back, uh, Jennifer Lisa. Thank you so much. Great well, it's good there. to have you. And we're, I'm gonna, we're gonna jump right into things with you. I'm gonna start with my question for you, actually. You know, we've talked in the past, Dr. Markman, about how to kind of keep the peace in families where um, this, uh, this election has been so divisive and people have such deep, strong feelings about Donald Trump or for him or against him. And, and kind of the real kind of division, the real pain that that has caused. But when you and I have talked in the past, we talked mostly about, um, you know, kind of how to um, keep the peace with people who don't want to speak to us anymore and, and things like that. I want to ask you kind of from a little different perspective on that. There are a lot of people in my life whom I love dearly and whom I would never dream of not speaking to over politics, but are strong supporters of Donald Trump. And I had the opportunity in talking, you know, a couple of days ago with, with somebody to kind of get a, a, better, a, a better look from their perspective. This idea that we've kind of put out there that everybody who voted for Donald Trump must be a racist, a bigot, a, a, you know, a, a hateful person in some way. You know, I've always made the argument that it's much more complex than that. We have to understand there are a lot of different things, a lot of different reasons that people come to support Donald Trump. Um, but it made me realize that there were people in my life that I love who think that everybody who knows they voted for Donald Trump looks at them and assumes that they're a racist. And I can imagine how hurtful that is for them. And it was hurtful for me to hear that, actually. So how do we how do we address that? How do we um, make it how do we make it clear to people like that, that that's we don't believe that we don't see that in them and make it safe and make it OK for us to have that exchange? Yeah. You know, I, I think that that part of what we need to do is is to begin to realize that the election is over. And admittedly, it's taking right. a little longer for some people to come to that conclusion than others. But but as we begin to really recognize that that the election is over, we have to shift our mode. Elections are fundamentally competitive. And so we are spending our time focusing on how our candidate is, is should be the victor. And, and so it really is an us versus them situation. Now that the election is over, now that now that it's very clear that, that Biden won, we need to actually now find our commonality with people. And so and so even though there's still a tendency to want to advocate for our side, uh, we have to actually squelch that a little bit right now. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think we have to recognize that deep down people love this country and and the, the, the outpouring of voting on both sides is an indication of how much people do love the United States and do care about this. That's what we have to tap into right now. So yes, absolutely right. it's the case that, that many people who supported Trump know how other people are looking at them. 
what we have to do is reach out and to and to you know explicitly or implicitly make it clear we know that you love the country. We have to now move forward. We have lots of things that need to be uh, fixed. There's lots of work that needs to get done. We're only going to do that if we find a way to get down and do that work together. And so, in many ways, what I've been encouraging people to do is just to fight to figure out what do you agree on. And stop the conversation before you get to the stuff you disagree about. Even if the agreement is just, yeah. um, I believe that everybody should have opportunity. You know, that I believe that everybody should be able to pursue their dreams. You know, even if it's at that level of abstraction, if we can start by finding those points of commonality and focus on those for a while, there will be plenty of time for us to, to redevelop our disagreements as we begin to figure out how to solve these problems, because I think there are legitimate disagreements about that. But I think if we begin to focus on those commonalities, we can also begin to shed some of the, the other elements uh, that, that have crept into it, some of the conspiracy theories that people float, some of the, the real divisiveness that, that, has, that has been part of the election. If we, if we start by just having some recognition of commonality, it's gonna be hard. And, and, and it may, you know, with some of the people in your life, it may also require, you know, biting the inside of your mouth a little bit. Because when somebody says right. something you fundamentally disagree with, or if somebody spouts a, a, the latest QAnon conspiracy theory, uh, you, you may wanna just jump in and correct them right away. And, and actually taking that step back and just asking some questions and listening is, is going to be a far more valuable way of allowing your relationship to move forward than trying to, to create a sense of disagreement. And, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, you know, you know to the extent, go ahead. No, go right to, ahead. Okay. To the extent that people think that you're listening to them, it actually makes them feel more human, right? It, it, and, so, and so you're going to feel less like I'm looking at you like a horrible person if I'm actually paying attention to what you said. So I like what you said a couple of seconds ago about um, find the things that you have in common and then stop at that. Like, it's okay to just not to choose to just not discuss politics over Thanksgiving dinner, right? Like, what's it? What's it? A, an easy way, a, a gentle way to just make the point that I don't want to. I don't want to discuss this topic. Let's move on. Uh, you know, I would read up a lot on the Cowboys and the Detroit Lions uh, before Thanksgiving. <laughs> you know, I mean, find find some other yeah. topics of conversation that are out there that that are that are not overtly political. And just, you know, and, and, and raise those, you know, there's a lot of great binge watching opportunities these days. Right. You know, I mean, most, most people are watching, you know, you, you know uh, so, some of these great series. So give us, you know, talk about some of that. You know, it's, it's fine to do that. It's actually fine to ask how people are doing. You know, um, it, it turns out most of us have, even though we think of our lives right now as being an endless series of the same day over and over again. Um, right. Actually, people, I love. There's a lot. I love that. What 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 an old fashioned idea to actually express care and interest in the yeah. person who's sitting at the dinner table with you. I love that. Yeah, yeah. So just you know, find out how people are doing. What are you thinking about? What are you feeling? Hey. Right. Dr. Markman, we we know as you just alluded to, things are pretty different this year in the way we're going to be celebrating the holidays. And most of us, if we're following the guidance, are going to be having remote gatherings with our family other than our, our nuclear household family. Um, and, and we asked people to call in today and, and give us questions that they had related to what those family dynamics um, during the holiday might be. And we have a, a live caller who has a question for us. Um, Nancy, where are you calling from and what is your question? Um, hi, everybody. I'm uh, calling from Boynton Beach, Florida. And uh, the question, I'm going to try to keep, keep it as concise as possible. Um, my uh, mom and dad are um, elderly. They're both in their 80s. They live in Buffalo, New York. Uh, due to COVID restrictions, we're not going to be at the table. Um, over the past uh, couple of years, well, probably since the Trump presidency or the election, um, our relationship has become increasingly restrained. Um, I'm a lifelong Democrat, progressive, liberal, et cetera. Uh, they're lifelong Republicans who did in fact vote 
first term for Barack Obama out of deep concerns for Sarah Palin being incompetent and too close to the presidency. Uh, due to a hatred of the Clintons, they went right back to Trump and uh, still don't seem to sense have the sense of urgency that I do. Um, they consume a lot of Fox News in the evening and some Rush Limbaugh just for good measure. And um, because of their age and uh, just the, you know, kind of see the clock ticking, I would like to bring our relationship back together. My mother, if anyone, is the one that brings up politics. What do you think about fill in the blank? So she wants to hear, even though she knows, and then she gets upset and goes into socialism, defunding the police, the squad, the whole, you know, Fox News playbook of boogeymen. And uh, it's, it's, it's hard, and, and I, I feel sad about it. I don't like to see this wedge in our family or small family. And um, I, I would like to know um, how I could reach out. I heard some good stuff prior to being asked to speak um, about listening in a loving way. Um, but I, I don't know if, what else I can do um, without uh, antagonizing or getting into a debate because they're, they're well-informed people. They do consume also NPR and Wall Street Journal and PBS. So I, I don't know why they still skew the Trumpism. Nancy, what a great question, and and what a difficult situation. Uh, particularly, you know, as your as your parents get older, uh, you know, you you want to have as much good time with them as as you can. I, I think that that there's a couple of things to to do. One is there's a, there's actually a lesson we can learn from politicians, which is that that remember how often they don't answer the question that they've been asked right. uh, in in debates. And I think that that even though you, your your mother may ask you directly uh, for an opinion about politics, that doesn't mean you have to answer that question. And and you can do that directly or indirectly, right? You can do it directly by saying, you know what, mom, I, I find that every time we have this conversation, it it just ends up badly for us, and and I I care too much about us to 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 to, to repeat that. Or you could just answer a different question that's sort of off to the side of that. And and I'll bet you know, given that how well informed that they are, that there are lots of, of stories in the news that, that don't necessarily have to have a political angle that you could have a conversation about that would allow you to stay current, to talk about current events without having to shade into a discussion of, of the politics. I think that there's, there's, lots of, there's lots of interesting things going on in the world right now. And, and just, just you know, asking questions about those and having that conversation may be a way of of having some interesting I discussion, I uh, uh, having an interesting discussion without having uh, a, a, an argument. Thank you. Yeah, and good luck, really. Uh, yeah. I, I, I... So here we have a tweet from one of our uh, one of our audience members. Um, for you with a question for you, Dr. Markman. Um, it's alarming to me how many people I know, even here in a blue state like Massachusetts, are refusing to believe that Trump lost. How can we combat, combat this departure from reality and facts? You know, I think we yeah. all have people in our lives, honestly, who are continuing to make that argument. And it, it seems, you know, it's to me, I think it's, it's math. It's just basic math. How, how can we be having this conversation still? Yeah, and and so you know, as much as I like to preach uh, understanding and caring and things like that, um, there's there's also a time to hold the line, right? I think that that uh, the fact that that we may have legitimate policy disagreements with people, that we may disagree about how to approach particular um, problems that need to be solved, there's a place where we want to create understanding. Frankly, uh, Joe Biden won the election; it's over, and. And one of the things that I, that I have, have started to do with people is really to ask, what's your long game here? You know, it, I mean, it, this is not a close election. This isn't 535 votes in, in, in Florida. This isn't, you know, a, a, a few hundred or a few thousand votes in a couple of states. These are, these are significant victories in many states. It is very, if you just take a step back for a second, it's very clear Joe Biden won the election. So what I want to ask, what I do ask people is what's your, what's your long game? If, 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 if Donald Trump is given the election after this, haven't we destroyed America? Haven't we actually 
uh, taken our most sacred activity, voting, and turned it into a complete farce. Right, right now, we, we still subscribe to the idea that our elections are free and fair. And, and we have no evidence to the contrary of that. If, if, if we were to allow Donald right. Trump to win this election, we will have destroyed America, full stop. And, and if, 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 in fact, we all love America, then we have to just recognize that for, for Trump supporters, the, the election didn't go the way that they wanted it to. And, and now it's time to move on. And, you know, it's, that's yeah. something we just have to keep repeating. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, and, and, uh, and, and not necessarily listening too much to the answer to that, because this is, this is, this is actually fundamental to the future of the country. And, and maybe that's something that we can all find agreement on when we reach that point where we agree that free and fair elections are fundamental to our democracy and maybe just move on from there. Yeah, I think that's right. So Dr. Markman, I'm gonna do something we don't do very often on the show and set politics aside for a minute. Um, we've all been doing so many, uh, having so much of our human interaction, both um, personally and professionally via Zoom, Skype, you know, all of these online platforms that we're using. And as as wonderful that, as they are as a way to be able to keep in touch when we can't physically be together, it's still very different. Um, so do you have any suggestions as people try to figure out what Thanksgiving and Christmas are supposed to look like this year and how we can still feel close to people when we're going to be so far apart and we're going to have this electronic barrier between us. We're not we're not all going to be sharing the same meals or, you know, seeing the gifts under the, the tree or or lighting the menorah, whatever however we celebrate the holidays. So how do we yeah. still feel close to people when we're not? Yeah. You know, I, I think that that one of the things that we need to do is to remember that that the holidays are wonderful because they give us an opportunity to get together. But but the fact is, we don't necessarily have to all cram into the same moment in order to celebrate together the way that we have in the past. And so if if we're living at a distance from our families and so we can't travel, I mean, I'm, I'm living in Austin, Texas. My, my uh, parents are in New Jersey. Uh, you, we don't necessarily have to call in during during uh, you know all call into some mass Zoom at the same time. I mean, we know how horrible that is. I mean, you know, just the three of us have sometimes had some trouble figuring out who's supposed to speak next. And and when there's right. eighteen of you on that call, it's thoroughly miserable, right? So I think what <laughs> we need to do is is just is to try it a little bit differently. Let's do it in small groups. So we can we can zoom and or or you know pick your technology of choice and I just have a small conversation and just have a bunch of small conversations you know Thanksgiving weekend is 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 going to be four or five days long depending on your on your work schedule so so make make time to have a bunch of small phone calls with people don't feel like you all have to be there at the same time and 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 then try and keep that up actually through the rest of the year and 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 just keep keep in touch with people. I think that's going to be important. You know, something I heard that somebody's a friend of mine is doing now that I really love is she started writing letters to people, like honest letters. Uh, and, and I got to tell you, you know, having, having gone to my, my mailbox today and pulled out uh, two magazines and three bills, uh, you know, a personal letter would actually brighten things up a little bit. It would, I think it would feel good. I think, I think going old, old school on this might be okay. Uh, and, and that might be a way of, of helping us to feel close to our, our, our families, even if we can't actually be in the same room with them. And then one other thing, which is, is during this holiday season, one of the things we know is that if you're lucky enough to live in a place where, where the weather isn't too terrible right now, spending a little time outdoors with people is okay. You know, taking a walk, uh, sitting on, on lawn chairs with some distance between you is good. And it is nice to be in the physical presence of other human beings. And so even if it's some friends uh, or neighbors, you know, do that. Uh, you know, just, just take some time to try to be around people when you can. Yeah, I, I love that. And your, your advice of, you know, continue those small Zoom and other types of uh, connections throughout the year. Don't just look at them as like the pressure on a holiday that you have to do something big. So kind of stepping out of the 
you know, the rain, the the circle of direct communication with other people in our families, uh, Dr. Markman. We know uh, as this presidency is going to transition now into uh, the 46th president, Joe Biden, um, we're going to have a president who's really taking this pandemic very seriously. We know that he's already uh, has a, a commission meeting trying to come up with, you know, science-based solutions to how to stop this pandemic, but it looks like it's going to be kind of a long haul. We see that the infections and the death rates, unfortunately, are increasing again. I think there's a lot of stress, um, anxiety that just comes with that knowledge, and that feeds sometimes people's anger that they want to fight with you about things they disagree with you about because there just seems like there's no end in sight. How do what what is a a good um, you know, a good exercise or a good thought process. How? What is a good way for us to try to really be able to understand that as long as it might be, there is an end in sight, you know, kind of address that anxiety that comes with with not knowing. Yeah, I think there's a few things about this. So, so one of the things I talk about a lot is you got to understand where anxiety comes from. Anxiety is an emotion you experience when your motivational system engages with a threat out there in the world. If you haven't gotten rid of that threat, you, you experience stress and fear and anxiety. And the more engaged you are with it, the stronger that feeling is. So what that means is that you have a few different ways that you can deal with that kind of anxiety. One is to try to calm yourself, right? And to, and to really, you know, just, just work on yourself and, and with other people to just breathe deep and really calm the energy down. Now, that kind of fixes the symptom, but it doesn't really fix the underlying problem. The second thing I think we need to do is to, is to really work with people to recognize that we understand a lot about this disease right now. And in particular, we understand what behaviors are safe behaviors. And so one way to not experience a tremendous amount of anxiety is just to keep doing the right things, wear that mask outdoors. Uh, and, and, and also, you know, keep your social, your social distance from people, but also, you know, engage in, in, you know, exercise and, and do, and, and can, you know, live, live in a, in a healthy way, right? We, it, it's, you know, you can't, you can't eat sourdough bread all the time, but then there's one other thing that's important to do, which is if, if this anxiety reflects this motivational system that is focused on a threat, one of the other things that you want to do and encourage your friends to do is to start looking for the beautiful, wonderful, desirable things that are out there in the world that we could be doing. Because that, that engages a different motivational system. That's what's called the approach system, the one that, that you go after when there's a great thing to do. And that's where you get those moments of joy and, and satisfaction and happiness. And so, you know, take up a hobby. You know, this is a great time to learn a new thing. Uh, whether it's a, you know, a musical instrument or, or, you know, crocheting or whatever it is. I mean, work on something, write something, you know, pursue something that you care about. And that's actually the best antidote to anxiety, because what it does is it flips you into this mode in which you are now looking at the world as if there are some positive things out there that you're trying to find. And, and that can be particularly useful because now you don't have all this excess energy that you're trying to channel into having these kinds of arguments with everyone. Well, Dr. Markman, I know we're going to lose you in just a couple minutes. So I wanted to give you an offer first. Thank you. And give you an opportunity to uh, give us any final words of wisdom as, as we're all heading into the next uh, month and a half or so, and, and then into this new year, but especially in the next month and a half when, when we are going to be spending, however we're doing it, we're going to be spending more time with family. Yeah, I, I think it's it's all about finding commonality. One of the things that I was recommending uh, not long ago is is everyone. If you still have your political signs up, take them down, replace them with an American flag. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I, I, love, I love I was as I was writing about this, I was thinking that you know we, we have that American flag. You you need red and blue to make it, uh, and the white reflects all the colors of the rainbow, right? So it it's it's you know it's all in there. And it's, it's a way for all of us to, to make that statement that at the end of the day, we're all Americans, we love this country, and we're gonna find a way to, to, to develop that common sense of humanity uh, because we have to do it. We, aren't seeing, we, we haven't seen that in our political leadership in a while. Uh, I know that, that Joe Biden has, has certainly created a lot of messages in that form, 
it, but, but if that's going to be taken up by everybody else, it's going to be because they're seeing it from us. They're going to see that hunger from us right. as the American people. And so, and so we have to actually create that change and then allow uh, all of our political leaders to reflect that. I love that, doc, Dr. Markman, the whole idea of um, replace your political signs with an American flag. That, you know, that just wraps up the whole, the commonality, what we share in common, what we all, we all love our country, as you said at the beginning of this. And we know that even in our disagreements, we're motivated by that shared uh, patriotism and, and love for the United States. Thank you so much for being with us again, Dr. Mark. We look forward to having you back soon. And I hope that you and your family enjoy the holidays that are coming up as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa, Jennifer. I, it's wonderful to talk to you. Can't wait to talk to you. Thank, Thank you. you. So Lisa, in addition to the flag item, my favorite thing that he said, that advice that he gave was to find new, new sources of joy. You know, find whether it's learning something new, finding right. new way, you know, taking on a new hobby, but you know, life is different right now and it's gonna be different for, for a little while longer. So let's find ways to find, find our happiness and find our points of joy in different places. I love that. Right, and it might be an opportunity to rediscover something that you haven't had time to do for a long time. Right. Um, if I had a piano in my house, I would be I would be playing that again. Oh. But if I've taken guitar back up uh, to see if I can become you know less a hack than I currently am. <laughs> um, but those are, those are things you know when when life was normal. Right. Uh, you set those things aside because there just wasn't time for them. So you know maybe, maybe so there's busy. a little good in this lousy situation. When this all started way back in March, uh, I was uh, in Florida with my parents, at, you know, down there helping, you know, staying with them. And I took up painting, which I'm terrible at, which I've never done before, which I've, but I've always wanted to be, you know, I've always wished I could be. Uh, and so I still, you know, play with that every now and then. And it's nice, it's fun to do something different and, you know, regardless of my lack of skill at it at the moment. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, encourage, I encourage people to do the same. So someday I'll have a little art show and you can play piano for me uh, while we're there, <laughs> bring your talent. So going forward, you know, there's so much going on in the world. We thought maybe when the election was behind us, we could all sort of take a breath and, and relax a little bit. And I hope that everybody is finding a way and a place to be able to do that. But one of the things we wanna do here at um, um, Lincoln Project TV, LP TV, as we go forward, is make sure that we keep you informed about what is continuing to be the most pressing issue in our country, and that is the pandemic. As you know, the um, numbers are rising again, not just here or there, it's almost everywhere. Uh, we, saw, we saw it out in the West just a couple of weeks ago. We know that the state of New York has just instituted um, a new restriction on gathering sizes. Uh, the numbers are increasing in Vermont and in New Hampshire, you know, right here uh, near Lisa and I, and, um, and we're seeing it all over the country. And we have, we just put a set of numbers together for you that we thought were informative. You can see going back to the beginning of this month and we're only halfway through the month. You know, on November 1st, there were 76,771 new cases diagnosed of the coronavirus in the United States. Yesterday, 161,651 new cases yesterday. Those are daily in uh, new infections diagnosed, those numbers that you see on the screen right now, they're, they're not being added to. Those are daily, each day, what has been diagnosed. And of course, naturally, uh, in the wake of that, we see hospitalizations increase uh, and we see deaths uh, begin to rise, unfortunately, along with that as well. So we wanna make sure that we keep you informed on these things. Um, and just, we're gonna take the opportunity every chance we get to encourage you to please take this seriously. There's one model out there that suggests that we could lose as many as 400 and some thousand American lives to this um, if we continue on the path that we're on right now. And we know that this was one of the most influential issues for people who decided to vote for Joe Biden over Donald Trump. Um, so we hope that you'll take it seriously. We're going to continue to try to bring you good information on that as we go forward. Uh, you know, Lisa, in our neck of the woods, the numbers are rising as well. They are. We've, you know, Vermont has been that little, little spot on the map for such a long time where we have kept our case count very low. And despite the best efforts and, and people here are wearing masks, but, you know, you start to let your guard down and those little gatherings are happening. And that's right. that all 
all it takes is those little family gatherings and suddenly the numbers explode. So please everybody, um, heed the experts. You know, they're doing this because, because they care about this country, they care about our health. Um, it's, it's not because they have any personal benefit to get out of it. So, you know, do, do your part and keep yourself, your family and the members of your community safe. Um, we're going to take a quick break right now. When we come back, we do have um, Zach uh, Chikowski coming back on with us to talk about uh, all things political. So uh, we will see you on the other side. Since the dawn of our nation, brave citizens have answered the call to arms when the country was in danger. We hold our veterans in reverence for their courage, their sacrifice, and their honor and service to their fellow Americans. Generations of Liberty's sons and daughters have gone into harm's way, manned the battlements, and sailed the seas to preserve freedom for all. Our nation owes a debt of gratitude we can never repay to those who have chosen to answer the call to arms. Today, we honor them and thank them for their service for their dedication to our nation's preservation, and for their oath to the Constitution on which the foundation of our government rests. On this Veterans Day, we ask all Americans to honor the over 18 million veterans among us and thank them for their continued dedication to our country, our freedom, and our future. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. They're at it again, trying to take away our right to vote. David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler support Donald Trump's plan to strip Georgia voters of our right to vote. Black and military voters will lose their voice. You can stop it. Vote for Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. We've come too far to go back to Jim Crow. We made history November 3rd. Let's do it again. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. Welcome back to LPTV and Vote for America. We're very excited to have uh, Zach Chikowski back with us again today. He's political director for the Lincoln Project and uh, the man with all the answers. So we have a lot of questions coming in from you folks and uh, Zach's gonna be here to tell us everything that we don't know. Uh, Zach, welcome to the show. Thank you all so much for having me on again. And Lisa, I just wanna start by saying those glasses are incredible. Uh, I wish I could pull them <laughs> off. I don't know if I quite could with my, my face structure. Uh, I'll, I'll send you a pair. I'm sure you can. Um, <laughs> Thank <no>. you. <laughs> Give us the uh, thousand foot post-election look at what's going on right now. And, and then we'll start doing some, some deeper dives into specific questions. You know, like like everybody, I think my focus is, is really going to be on Georgia for the next uh, couple of months. It's a January 5th runoff election. Um, it's a really unique system, which is rooted in a long history of disenfranchisement. It, it didn't start becoming the top two, uh, the, the, the get to 50 in the general until 1962. This is an intentional system meant to disenfranchise voters because when you have a January 5th election, you're going to see lower turnout uh, than you might in a, in a typical presidential. So it's going to be tough to win, but I think both Warnock uh, and Ossoff are in a strong position. Leffler and Purdue have clearly. Uh, thrown their lot in with the president rather than with the American people and are, you know, doing everything in their power to make sure that they cater to his ego and, and fragile sensitivities rather than doing what's best for hardworking Georgians. So it's going to be a tough race, but a winnable race in, in both cases. And if we're able to flip both those seats, uh, we will have a 50-50 split in the Senate and Kamala Harris will be Mitch McConnell's boss, which would really be something and, and a great <laughs> turn of event. Uh, you know, I think like everybody as well, I hope that we would win more seats in, in the general election than we did, uh, and I hope the results would be even more resounding. But one thing that I want to note is that the last time a, a, a presidential incumbent lost, I was not yet a year old. Uh, we did something historic, and I think while we didn't achieve everything we set out to, everyone should be enormously proud that Donald Trump on January 20th will no longer be the president of the United States. 
Yeah, Zach, I want to ask you a little bit more about Georgia there. The um, and, and first of all, you're right. It, you know, the whole, that whole it takes a village concept. It takes a village to unseat a wannabe tyrant, too. And it was everybody, everybody who was part of that. But, um, you know, we had this weird thing in the results where we know that across the battleground states where the Lincoln Project played, we had uh, on average six and a half percent of the voters who supported Trump in 2016 came over to support Joe Biden in 2020, which was our primary focus here at the Lincoln Project. But we also saw that down ballot, those folks went back and voted for their Republican Senate, mm -hmm. Republican Senate candidates, you know, and we had kind of this, this weird split ballot thing. So what are we going to do, the Lincoln Project, now that we can focus just on Georgia? I mean, Georgia is a high bar regardless in, to try to get a Democrat candidate to win in Georgia. What are we going to be able to do um, from in the Lincoln Project to address that? And what are are there going to be opportunities for folks who are watching to be part of that? Absolutely. You know, I think this election is going to be a turnout, turnout, turnout election because nobody knows uh, how many folks are going to show up. Runoffs are are notoriously unpredictable. Uh, so I think one of the first and, and most important things that everybody can do is if you know somebody in Georgia, start by just telling them about the election that it's January fifth and that they should vote. Uh, there's going to be three weeks of early voting, but it's going to be complicated because we've got the holidays. Uh, so one thing that I would also encourage right. everybody to do is really be aggressively pushing folks to vote by mail. Ballots drop on the 18th. The election is upon us already. I know uh, many folks are hoping to take a little bit of a breather, but Georgia is coming. So getting folks to re-request an absentee ballot, um, folks are not going to automatically receive one just because they voted by mail in the general election. So making sure that they get those ballots and then get them in early. We don't know what kind of postal delays they're going to be, but you can only delay a ballot by so long. Uh, so if you get your ballot in late November and turn it in early December, you can feel more than confident that it's going to be counted. There will also be drop-offs for folks. Uh, and one thing that we're really excited about is by popular demand and also out of necessity, we'll be bringing back the troll hunter trainings. Uh, right now with no political advertising on Facebook, YouTube, and Google, uh, there are, is misinformation left and right, and we have to go stop that at the source. So I would encourage everybody uh, next week to join us for one of those Troll Hunter trainings. Well, let's talk about misinformation a little bit more then. Um, you know, everybody, it was such a big focus of ours at the Lincoln Project, especially in the, the final weeks of the election and um, how effective Russia and other foreign bad actors are at planting and, and spreading misinformation. But since the election, the bulk of the misinformation that people are really um, kind of being inundated by and apparently buying into has to do with election results, which to you and I, we look at it's it's a pretty clear cut process. Votes have been counted. Ballots have been recounted. The numbers have have come back the same. And yet we just saw a, um, a poll that came out a couple of days ago that show a significant number of Republican voters now believe that the outcome of the vote is in question. Where does that misinformation come from and how do we combat it? You know, this is something that I think you can only prepare for, but so much. We knew that, you know, foreign actors will be meddling in our elections and we are prepared for that and we're taking steps to remedy it. One thing that I think is so scary and so frustrating is that the primary source of much of this information is the outgoing president of the United States. Uh, Donald Trump has 90 million Twitter followers, roughly. And every single day, it's six or seven or 15 or 30 tweets of his are labeled by Twitter as misinformation. Uh, I don't know if y'all have seen the video where somebody scrolls through his feed and it's just uh, misinformation after misinformation after misinformation. He's saying, I won big, it was stolen from me. Uh, and it's much more difficult to combat the leader of a party. Uh, and unfortunately, currently still the leader of the free world who is spewing this nonsense. So it makes things trickier. But one thing that we can do is make sure that it doesn't get further amplified by these bots. And that's what we can do with the bot training. But, but Jennifer, I'd love to hear from, from you and Lisa uh, how you're combating what the president is saying with friends and family members, because it's much tougher if it's coming from the president of the United States than some anonymous egg account on Twitter. Well, that's the challenge, yeah. isn't it? When it's just, you know, you and your brother or sister across the table and somebody's quoting the, the guy who's supposed to be the leader of the free world. You know, that's that's always for I try to, you know, for me, I try to provide sources. I'm just always big on, you know, where did you hear it? Where did you read it? Read, read this, read that. Let's broaden our sources as much as we can. Uh, but you can't you can't over, you know, overemphasize 
how dangerous it is when the president of the United States engages in this sort of thing. And, and I think one of the other things you have to, whoop, I'm right. sorry, Zach. Sorry. I think one of the things we have to um, remind people of is that you can't split these ballots apart and say, this vote was valid, these votes were invalid, somehow there was fraud that only happened on part of a ballot. And they, they want to believe um, down ballot races, but they don't want to believe the top of the right. ticket. And it, it doesn't work that way. So when, you know, a lot of the pushback that the president is trying to give, if you, if you don't just uh, take what he says for gospel and you think for a moment about the logic of what he's saying, it breaks down really quickly because it isn't logical. It doesn't make any sense. It's so true. And, and you know, if you look at the motive, as well uh, of these different sources. Donald Trump clearly has motive, which is that uh, he's trying to leverage his position as much as possible, whether that's to get a pardon for himself, uh, whether that's to get approvals for some of the acting folks that he's appointing, who knows? Uh, but he has clear incentive, clear motive. And this has nothing to do with what's good for the American people. It has, with, it has everything to do with what's good for Donald Trump. And I think there is one thing that he has been consistent about throughout his entire life, which is that he doesn't care about anybody but himself and will behave accordingly. And that's what he's doing right now. Yep, absolutely. Let's go ahead and get another tweet in here from our audience. For the future, apart from squashing bots, how do we deal with small media outlets who share disinformation such as true callers on air? My 78 year old mother was radicalized by one. I live in Ohio, so you can see the issue. Wow, that's that's a great question. And it's so frustrating when you see a family member radicalized like that. But one of the best things folks can do is, is support local media and local journalists. You know, buy whatever your hometown newspaper is, write letters to the editor, write op eds, be engaged with it, make sure that your friends and family are reading local news as well. Because as we've seen these news deserts pop up, the thing that fills the vo fills the void oftentimes are these misinformation sites. So if you've got a strong local paper that you can support, please do so. If you don't, then make sure that you're getting everybody that you know uh, to get their information, exactly like Jennifer said, from reputable outlets. You know, if some if you haven't heard of a paper, you know, make sure that you're double checking exactly what it is that, that you're reading and, and where you're reading it from. Exactly, and it's it's hard to it's hard to have that conversation. Sometimes people think they that their sources are reputable, as you say, and it's not always the case. Um, you know, and here's another, just to add to that quickly, one of the things I've done now is I find things, you often find information on the internet and it'll have a URL that sounds almost familiar, but not quite. I copy it into my Google search bar with the question, is this a credible website? And uh, you'd be surprised at how quickly you can find out that it is or isn't. So just, you know, 30 seconds on, on Google and you can figure things out. Uh, we have a call for you. We have a caller for you, Zach. Um, let's take our question from the caller. Welcome to the show. Okay, welcome. Okay. Are we all, there we go. Hi, hi there, I, I'm here. <laughs> okay, good. So, so excited that I got through and I just wanted to express my gratitude to you guys. I mean, you, I know you've heard this before but you kept me sane and um, I just, I, I just, you know, feels like I don't know what I would have done because you really did keep me sane. Oh. Um, my Thank question you is, that. you're, you're welcome. Um, you know, with Donald Trump, um, saying that he might run in 2024, how likely do you think that is? And will you guys be around if that happens? Well, Zach, I'll let you take that first, but the, the second, the second part's easy. Yeah, <laughs> you will be. Yes, we will be around if he does. How likely do you think that is Zach? You know, I, I think that there is a very strong possibility that, that he will. Um, you know, I think at the same time, he will be 78 years old. He's not exactly the pinnacle of, of human health, though. So I think there are going to be, and it is very difficult to run for office. Will he have the energy and the stamina? I don't know. Um, but if he thinks that running for office will help him monetize his brand or prevent him from being prosecuted for some of the things that, that are in the wind right now, he absolutely will. 
And it's not just Trump we have to worry about. It's one of the Trump children. You know, we could very well see Ivanka running. We could see Don Jr. running uh, because he is, for, for better or worse, and I think we would certainly argue for much worse, he is the leader of the Republican Party. He is the face of the Republican Party. And at the very least, he is the gatekeeper, if not the presumptive nominee in 2024. What do you all think? And Zach, Zach, I say, Zach, I'm going to disagree with you, actually. I think it's less likely that Donald Trump will actually run in 2024. I think he will say that he's going to, or he'll say that he's thinking about it. But uh, I think to your point, it's gonna be all about monetizing the circumstances for him, for him. And his best opportunity to do that will be to not run again. But he is likely to try to sort of freeze the field and talk about it until he figures out which Trump he wants to have run in his place. You know, we all talk about Trump Jr. putting his name on the ballot, but you know that if Donald Trump, uh, you know, if Trump Sr. had his way, it would be Ivanka. Um, I, I think that the Trump family seriously sees one of them being on the ballot in 2024. I just don't think it's going to be uh, the guy who's sitting in the Oval Office right now. The one thing we yeah, can say with certainty. Of... Sorry, Lisa, go ahead. He goes that. <laughs> I was just going to say the one thing we can say with certainty is that the Trump Tower Moscow will be getting built at some point in the next four years. Right. Uh, right. You know, there's right. going to run or not, yeah. though. Exactly. Um, the, exactly. The other piece of monetizing that I wanted to mention is that it, it's already happening. And this the fundraising for his legal fund right now, we need to be really clear that you have to read the small print in those fundraising emails that that you're receiving because initially it's a 60-40 split between Donald Trump's new slush fund pack and the RNC. And once a minimum, which is about $8,000 from a donor comes in, then anything above that goes into the legal fund. So these small dollar donors, he's picking their pockets again right, and right. being incredibly deceptive about where that money's going. So it's just, it, it's so offensive that these people trust him and, and this is what he does to them again and again. Um, we have another caller on the line. Uh, let's go ahead and bring on Tori. Tori, where are you from and what question do you have for us today? Hi. Oh, I'm sorry, Tony. I apologize. That's okay. Um, I'm from New York and I keep listening to the news and the Republicans are saying, well, we'll see once the votes are certified, once the electors certify the votes. And right. I just feel like there's a loophole there somewhere. Some Something doesn't feel right. Like Donald Trump could go in and, and assign new electors because he likes firing everybody. I I just feel very nervous about it. Is there a way for him to get certified the winner when he did not get the vote? I, I'll jump That's in it. on this one, Zach, and uh, and then you can tell me where I'm missing it. There's there's not. That's that's just one of those th another one of those things that the president and his some of his people are trying to feed. There are you know in it. It, technically, there might be a state or two where they could, that were legislatively, they could do something. But here's the reality politically. Um, the way that the, re, the two major parties in this country have been dealing with each other over the past two decades, if they did anything like that, they know that right behind it, next time around, this next cycle that comes up, uh, it's going to be turned around and directed at them. Um, and the other thing is, I think that it would be a mistake for us to underestimate the character of these people who act as electors. Just like the Republicans have underestimated um, the character of the judges that they have seated, that they thought were gonna be in their pocket, and they come in and they actually uh, respect uh, and, and revere the Constitution and do their job anyway. I think the same is gonna be And the final thing I would say is that uh, Biden is ahead by so many at this point, it would be really difficult for them to find enough uh, of these electors who were willing to um, betray their betray their responsibility. I think to turn those numbers. Uh, what What do you think, Zach? Did uh, do I have that right? I, I I jumped on that one because we I've been hearing it so much in the last forty eight hours, and I think it's really important to tamp it down. I think you're on the money, and I think if there's any question, uh, so, so so check check this out. Look at the court cases so far. Uh, Donald Trump right. has not. Not only has he not won any of them, uh, he has been sternly rebuked with some of the, like the sassiest findings or filings yes. that I've. And I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know the exact term. But some of these are absolutely hilarious, yeah. and and how quickly they are shot down, and how decisively they are shot down. So I think you were on the money with that, Jennifer. 
Yeah, and it's a good time to re, to let re, to tell people. Also, we just learned this morning. You know, one of these bigger um, um, legal cases that the Trump team thought they were going to get some traction on in Philadelphia. His his lawyers left the case today. His lawyers uh, pulled out of the case I, and and left him. The only lawyer left on that case right now, as of right now, is a guy who's basically a divorce lawyer. Uh, while the Trump team goes looking for for new representation. It, they're, these, they're just, it's not just that they're not going anywhere. They have no basis. That's why they're not going anywhere. Can I actually just give somebody, everybody a fun thing to do that I've been doing for the last little bit? Uh, I signed up for of the course. Trump campaign text messages and all of them cost money to send. So I just respond to every <laughs> single one with like a thinky face emoji and then they respond again. And then I do another thinky face or like a smiley face emoji. And it costs them like four cents for every time that I do that. But you know, if you do it a hundred times in a day, that's four dollars. And if a you know a couple thousand people do that every day, they're losing money they don't have. It. And it's also very satisfying. So highly recommend doing that. Oh, I love it. That's great. My my sons have been having a lot of creative fun. Uh, with some of the things that Trump has been asking for too. So that's that's great to hear. That's another good one I'm gonna pass on to them. We have another caller on the line. Uh, Visar, where are you calling from and what question do you have for us? Good evening, I'm calling from Kosovo. Hello there. Um, my name is Visar Welcome. and uh, I, I wanted to congratulate the Lincoln Project for the most patriotic uh, campaign that it has done in the past few months. Uh, it has really restored faith of the world in America, and uh, um, we congratulate you for the elections, for the results of the 3rd November. My question is, um, what is the future of Trumpism? I mean, we have over 70 million Americans who have voted for Trump. And is it just, uh, is this a permanent change or is it just a pause for a continuation of uh, after four years? I mean, we have seen uh, many problems with NATO that Trump has caused uh, with allies. He toppled our government in Kosovo just because uh, the, uh, the let, uh, former government was not ready to become a part of the, his campaign uh, for these elections. Um, uh, so uh, we are scared on the future of America and the world. Uh, with what, with what happened in the past four years, we would never imagine that, you know, uh, these kind of events would happen ever in America. So, right. how can you make sure that you know uh, American people that the world is safe uh, 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 in the future? Yeah, that's a that is a powerful question. That is a powerful question. It's one of the things that we've talked about at the Lincoln Project throughout this cycle. Um, just how dangerous uh, it can be to have Donald Trump or somebody like him in the White House. And we've learned that firsthand multiple times over the last four years, um, how irresponsible and how dangerous his, you know, him being irresponsible can be to the country. Um, as much as everybody's very discouraged by the fact that 70 million people voted for this president, we have to reassure them that 78 million people voted for somebody else. You know, this is what America is about, that we have freedom of speech, freedom of political speech, that we debate these different ideas that Everybody can come to the table. Uh, everybody gets a vote. Everybody gets to make their voice heard. That free and fair elections are the cornerstone of our democracy. Not only has that not changed, this election has um, has reassured us of that. It has it has emphasized it and highlighted it uh, in a way that a lot of people thought it wouldn't. It it was a slow count. It took us longer to get here, but every ballot has been counted. There is zero um, evidence of fraud, especially of any sort of um, broad fraud across the system. Uh, over and over and over again over the last week, uh, it has been questioned and then proven to have been a free and fair and honest and a credible election. And I think the message to the world for people who are worried about the, the position and the role that we play in the world is that the American people just stood up and protected our democracy. The American people just stood up and, and, um, and, and sent the clear message. You know, I've said this a few times, a loud, clear message through the ages that we do reject Donald Trump. Uh, Joe Biden has an overwhelming win in the popular vote. He has a significant and indisputable win in the Electoral College. We are always going to be a nation of different ideas, of uh, different voices. 
but we're also always going to be a nation that stands up and speaks out against that which is most uh, damaging to us and to the world, the bigotry, the racism, the misogyny, uh, the corruption. And that's really what we saw here today. But that fight doesn't ever end. And Trumpism doesn't go away overnight. The Lincoln Project is not committed to one political party or another. We're committed to being a pro-democracy organization. So our voice is not going to be silenced after this either. Zach, I'd love to hear your political answer, take on that. Guys, that's all I got. <laughs> that's, no, that's a tough, that's a tough uh, answer to follow because I think it was so spot on. And, you know, I think to the, the question, I would say people in this country and around the world are frustrated and angry. They feel like they were promised something better, that there are opportunities that are no longer available to them. And I think that anger and frustration has boiled over and it's manifested itself in ways that are unproductive and have led to more anger and racism and xenophobia and things like that because people are lashing out. And so to, to really cure Trumpism, it's not enough uh, just to defeat people electorally. You have to give folks something to hope for, something to believe in. They need to know that they can still do what, whatever it is they hope to do with their lives. They have opportunities. And right now, I think we're, we're just not seeing that because we've had so much partisan gridlock. And so that's why, to Jennifer's point, it's so critical that we elect people who are going to put the country first, not their political ambitions first. And I think that we are going to start seeing a new crop of candidates popping up who are reacting to that. Folks who maybe never wanted anything to do with politics, but feel compelled to step up because we remain a nation in a world in crisis. Uh, and so I, I am optimistic for the future. And I'm in part optimistic because of folks like, like Jennifer and, and the founders of the Lincoln Project who left their party, uh, left, left many, in many cases friends and family members behind to do something that is right. And I think we're going to see that happening across the country and across the world. And that's what's going to be what gets back on track, the people, not the politicians. Zach, that's, that's such a perfect wrap up to the conversation that we've had with you today. Thank you so much for joining us again, giving us uh, you know everything from uh, information on misinformation information on misinformation that uh, people can really use and feel like they're part of our democracy and also the lay of the land in Georgia and what we have coming up. So thank you very much. We look forward to having you back with us again very soon. Thank you both for having me. This has been fantastic. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. So um, as we have. Uh, more of these states rolling in now finally uh georgia and arizona being called for donald trump uh, for joe biden i've been thinking a lot about donald trump's uh reaction to uh to being a loser and as we know that's something that uh trump had told us himself he was not going to be very good at and he's certainly been demonstrating that uh for us in spades but um it's been especially disheartening to see that the Republicans in Congress are still, even after an election loss, they are unwilling to stand up and call out what the president is now doing to damage our democracy. And no one likes losing. I mean, there's, there's just nothing enjoyable about it. But when you are the president of the United States or you hold any elective office, when you lose, you have a responsibility to put your country ahead of your party and ahead of your political ambitions and do the right thing. And so we, we can't really hope we're going to see this for Donald Trump, but I hope that he does at some point take a look at a really wonderful example that we have from the not terribly distant past of a Republican president who did run for re-election and lost that uh, re-election bid. And that was George H.W. Bush. Um, he lost to Bill Clinton. And no doubt that was incredibly painful uh, for him to experience. But he did the right thing. And I want to share the letter that he left for a uh, newly sworn in President Clinton uh, in the Oval Office for, for Clinton to come in and read. And, and the letter uh, reads like this, Dear Bill, when I walked into this office just now, I felt the same sense of wonder and respect that I felt four years ago. I know you'll feel it too. I wish you great happiness here. I never felt the loneliness some presidents have described. There will be very tough times, 
made even more difficult by criticism you may not think is fair. I'm not a very good one to give advice, but just don't let the critics discourage you or push you off course. You will be our president when you read this note. I wish you well. I wish your family well. Your success now is our country's success. I'm rooting hard for you. Good luck. Now, one of the reasons right now that it's especially important that Donald Trump be handling this uh, transition appropriately, which he is not, and for his Republican enablers to stop being enablers and speak up is the COVID pandemic that we were talking about. Um, right now, the ability for Biden to be able to come in and address this as as well as we need him to is being hampered by the actions of the Republicans who are in power. And it is uh, it is a devastating number that between now and uh, Biden's inauguration, we could have another 100,000 Americans dead. So I, I hope Republicans uh, in office will finally find their spines and do the right thing and put saving American lives ahead of their political ambitions. I don't have a lot of hope that it's going to happen. Uh, the hope that I do have and the confidence that I do have is in the American people and also knowing that uh, the Lincoln Project is going to be here to remind the Republican enablers going forward of the mistakes that they've made when they are coming up for re-election. Lisa, thank you for that. As always, it's great having you here. Uh, I appreciate thank it you. so much. And of course, I just want to say thank you to Zach Tukowski, the political director from the Lincoln Project, uh, and Dr. Markman, who's always so um, encouraging in his guidance to us and how to respect and preserve those relationships that uh, are so uh, important to us in our lives. And of course, thank you to everybody who participated today, your questions from your tweets and your phone calls and your joining our Zoom question. We love having you be part of it. You can always uh, get in touch with us on social media by using the hashtag vote for America. Uh, and I just want to leave you today uh, with uh, thoughts of great optimism that I am genuinely optimistic as I look to the future for our country. You know, it's going to be a difficult 67 days, but it's only 67 days until the next president's going is going to be sworn in that President Joe Biden will become 46th president of the United States. Uh, and I think maybe it's time for all of us to rise above uh, some of the, the Trump chaos and division and uh, foolishness that he is bringing to all of this. And remember that we won, all of us together, we won. We worked together, we stood strong, we did the right thing, we spoke up, we voted, we organized, and we won by an overwhelming, unassailable victory and the, the future is bright for our country. And we see in how Joe Biden has conducted himself uh, during these difficult last uh, seven days that we made the right choice. He's announced his pandemic commission. He's appointed an experienced, uh, responsible uh, person uh, to be his chief of staff. Uh, he has taken exactly the right tone when asked by the press about uh, whether or not the president will or should concede. Trump is never gonna concede. That shouldn't be our goal. Our goal should be to get peacefully uh, transitioned to the next president. That's what we are in path, uh, on our path to do. Donald Trump is acting exactly the way that we all knew that he would, exactly the way we expected him to, like a, a spoiled child, like a, a, a playground bully who finally picked on somebody who was bigger and stronger and smarter than he was. Uh, and and I, I just, it's time for us to put it aside. Good, Donald Trump is acting like Donald Trump. Now let's all of us act like Americans. Let's come together. Let's start mending the fences. Let's start uh, embracing the fact that we're always going to have differences. Uh, we're planning the holidays to be with the people that we love, regardless of our political differences, regardless of uh, who you voted for, who you didn't vote for. America is strong. I've said this a thousand times since I got involved in politics. We are strong, not because of our politicians, but because of our people. And we're going to continue to be strong because of people like you who care so deeply and have engaged and stayed in the fight with us. I hope you have a terrific weekend. LPTV will be back here again next Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. And we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much for being with us today. The end is coming. 
The end of the noise and lies. The end of the chaos and division. The end of the hate. In its place, a new America is ready to stand tall again. Ready to restore the goodness in the heart of our nation. Ready to put people before politics. Ready to lead, to innovate, to grow, to heal. It won't always be easy. There are tough times to come. COVID to be defeated, an economy to restore. But that new day is coming. A day when words like caring, competent, and professional won't be insults. A day when compassion and character mean more than celebrity. A day when every American's rights are respected and valued. That day is coming because of your hard work, your commitment, your energy, and passion. That day is coming because of your vote. Joe Biden, our president. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. Yes, hello. My name is Pedro. I'm in Arlington, Virginia. I'm just wondering if any of the government officials who violated the Hatch Act can be prosecuted after the fact if there is a statute of limitations, even though the president is exempt. 